Back to the Future Part 3 was released in the summer of 1990. It is the third and final instalment of the Back to the Future trilogy. The film takes place immediately after the events of Part 2. The second and third Back to the Future movies were shot back to back over the course of 11 months, with a three week break between Part 2 and Part 3. Filming took place in both California and Arizona. The film was a commercial success and achieved nearly 250 million worldwide. Critics also gave Part 3 better reviews than Part 2, which had been met with mixed reviews at the time. I think mainly down to the idea of Part 2 going back to the first film and not introducing something completely new, but I think Part 2 was a very smart sequel by doing a twist on the original and revisiting classic scenes while Marty and Doc are trying to avoid bumping into themselves. On November the 12th, 1955, Marty McFly discovers that his friend Doc Emmett Brown had become trapped in the year 1885. Marty, with Doc's 1955 self, uses the information in Doc's letter to locate and repair the DeLorean. While retrieving the car, Marty spots a tombstone with Doc's name, dated six days after the letter was written. Learning that Doc was killed by Biff Tannen's great-grandfather, Buford Mad Dog Tannen, Marty decides to go back to 1885 to save Doc. Marty arrives on September 2nd, 1885, in the middle of a United States cavalry pursuit of Indians. While evading the pursuit, the DeLorean's fuel line is torn, forcing Marty to hide the car in a cave and walk to Hill Valley. Marty meets his Irish-born great-great-grandparents, Seamus and Maggie McFly. Marty runs afoul of Buford and his gang. Buford tries to hang Marty, but Doc saves him at the last minute. Doc agrees to leave 1885. But with the DeLorean out of gasoline and no more available, there is no way to accelerate the car to 88 miles per hour. Doc devises a scheme to use a locomotive to push the DeLorean up to speed. As Doc and Marty explore the rail track they intend to use, they spot an out-of-control horse-drawn wagon. Doc saves a passenger, Clara Clayton. The two fall in love pretty much instantly. Buford tries killing Doc at a town festival, but Marty intervenes. Buford then persuades Marty into a showdown in two days' time. Consulting the photograph of Doc's tombstone, they note that Doc's name has disappeared, but the date on the tombstone remains unchanged. Doc warns Marty that he, not Doc, might be killed by Buford. With the introduction of Clara, played by Mary Steenburgen, she does a splendid job with the role. The actress's children had begged her to do it once she was offered the part, and she had worked with Christopher Lloyd before, so she couldn't say no. As a kid I found her quite annoying, but probably down to being a young lad and not being interested in watching people fall in love. But as I got older, I really liked the story arc of Doc Brown falling in love. The actress Mary Steenburgen is cast really well, and she has a smile that will make you weak at the knees. Part 3 has some great comedic scenes, mostly from Doc Brown. I love the 1950s version of him, he is so eccentric and over the top with everything, as you can see here. Indeed, I now recall that moments after the time vehicle disappeared into the future. Oh, I saw a vision of Marty say he had come back from the future. Oh. Hey, Doc. Undoubtedly, this was some sort of a image. Doc! Ah! <laughs> Doc, calm down, okay? Just calm down. It's me, it's Marty. No, it can't be you. I sent you back to the future. Hey, Doc, that's right, but I came back again. I came back from the future. Don't you remember last night? You fainted. I brought you home. This can't be happening. You can't be here. It doesn't make sense for you to be here. I refuse to believe that you are here. But the character of Buford Tannen 
steals the film, even though I feel he has less screen time than the previous versions of Biff. He is definitely the highlight of the series. The actor Thomas Wilson really impressed me the most out of all the actors in the Back to the Future trilogy. Here are some of the great moments of Buford Tannen. Well, since you never paid me for the job, I say that makes us even. Wrong! See, I was on my horse when it threw the shoe and I got thrown off. And that caused me to bust a perfectly good bottle of fine Kentucky Red Eye. So the way I figure it, Blacksmith, you owe me $5 for the whiskey and $75 for the horse. That's $80. Look, if your horse threw a shoe, bring him back and I'll reshoe him. I don't shot that horse! Hey, lighten up, jerk! Mighty strong words, Runt. Eight o'clock Monday, Runt. If you ain't here, I'll hunt you and shoot you down like a duck. It's dog, Buford. Shoot him down like a dog. Let's go, boys! Let these sissies have their party! I'm not really feeling up to this today. So I'm gonna have to forfeit. Forfeit? Forfeit! What's that mean? Um, it means that you win without a fight. Without shooting? You can't do that. Hey, you can't do that! You know what I think? I think you ain't nothing but a gutless yellow turd! Buford Tannen, you're under arrest for robbing the Pine City stage. You got anything to say? I hate my noise. The special effects in the film are generally kept to a minimum. When you think of Back to the Future you sometimes think it's an effects driven film, but they are only a small percentage of shots in the series with special effects. Obviously apart from part 2 with the introduction of flying cars and scenes with multiple characters played by the same actor. The visual effects are mainly used for the transitions from one period of time to the other. Part 3 has some great miniatures. With the destruction of the train at the end they built a quarter scale miniature for the final scene when it flies off the track. And at the end, the introduction of the flying time travelling train does look fantastic, even though the idea of it is a bit silly, they actually built a full scale one. Alan Silvestri returns to score the sequels and provides his great themes from the first film, and I feel he introduces more original material into part 3. With the different settings and period of time, he had to add more classical western style themes. ZZ Top provide a cameo in the film and play the band at the festival. They also produced a music video and song called Double Back to coincide with the movie's release. I was never really a fan of ZZ Top, and I feel the Huey Lewis music from the first film is far superior. The music video is very 80s and it superimposes a lot of scenes of the movie over the band, looking very similar to the Living Daylights video by AHA. There was a video game released, naturally, and it was terrible as usual. The programmers only produced four levels, which is a total disgrace and shows a complete lack of effort. Because of the short nature of the game, they whacked up the difficulty so high, it became increasingly difficult to get past the first level. If you manage to remember all the patterns in the game, like avoiding canyons and flying objects, you can complete the game in just under 10 minutes. This was released on a number of formats, but the desired format people played it on was the Sega Mega Drive or the Amiga. The graphics weren't too bad, but it became a game people wanted to throw out the window after playing it for only a few minutes. Siskel and Ebert were split on their opinions on Back to the Future Part 3. Roger Ebert was not happy with the town looking like a typical Hollywood western. Back to the Future Part 3 looks great. It's obvious that they have spent tens of the millions of dollars they made with this series. Gorgeous western settings. I love a nostalgic shot of Mary Jean Virgin, remember, in a beautiful purple dress standing next to that green train green railroad car, top light writing, and fine performances all around. I don't know, Gene, I didn't like it as much as you did, and one of the problems is, as a Western movie, this didn't work very well. Now, if you add all of the time travel onto the top of it and your memory of the two previous movies in the series, I suppose that would help, but the problem is, this Western town is a movie Western town. It's straight out of cliches, 
There's even Pat Buttram drinking in the bar. I like along seeing with him. with a couple of other guys. Dub Taylor was in the That's bar, right. too, I think. I love seeing those and guys. And so wouldn't it have been more interesting if Michael J. Fox had gone back to the real Old West instead of to the movie Old West and gone back to a real time in the past rather than a fictional time in the past? Well, he's going to a fictional time in the future when he, when in part two, and you enjoyed that picture. So... Um, you know, the question is, was it entertaining? Yeah, I but mean, the problem here is, you see, there isn't as much time travel or paradox in this movie. Basically, once they get back there, it becomes a Western. Right? The, yeah, and I like that. Time. And it wasn't a very... If this were only a Western, you wouldn't say it was a very good Western. It's not only a Western. Uh, but the stuff but you they... wouldn't say it was a good Western if it were only a Western. But it isn't only But a... it isn't. But the Western what, part isn't so good. No, here, I don't... No, no, that's where I differ with you. The part that is a Western was very entertaining for me. I just reviewed oh, all the on. parts of it. The Steen Virgin and Christopher Lloyd are a lot of fun uh -huh. together, and he has some fun with Western conventions. The movie worked for me. Back to Future Part 3, I feel is better than Part 2, mostly down to having the heart and feel of the first film. With the movie concentrating more on Doc Brown and developing more of his character, it mirrors Marty's exploits from the first movie, so they all have a pattern which people may find to be unoriginal, where it's essentially repeating its plot outline, but if that doesn't bother you, you'll find it to be a very entertaining movie. Part 3 does feel a lot shorter than the first two films, maybe down to it being a little light on story, which is strange because its running time makes it out to be the longest in the series. Marty, I suppose, has less to do in Part 3, and he doesn't really communicate much with his relatives. You can nitpick the sequels all you like, for example Elizabeth Shue's awful wig, but in the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many flaws you find or feel it doesn't match the first film, they are still very good sequels nonetheless. As a kid I found part 3 to be the weakest because I was never a fan of westerns, but as I got older I appreciated the story a lot more and the chemistry between the actors. The love story may be very cliched, it's the idea of love at first sight, but you can forgive all that because the connection between Doc Brown and Clara is so strong and you don't want them to be separated. The Back to the Future trilogy is one of the best series of films out there. Luckily the trilogy hasn't been tarnished with a poor follow up i.e. a part 4 like Indiana Jones. If you're going to do a series of movies, then it's best to leave it at the third one. Because it's a three part act like all stories where there is a start, middle and an end. A fourth movie always doesn't seem to go anywhere, because essentially there's nothing much else to tell. Robert Zemeckis and the co-writer Bob Gale are huge western fans and you can tell they're having fun with the movie. They throw in loads of references to old western flicks and include cameos from actors who have appeared in dozens of westerns. The camera angles are very inventive and the look of the movie is to a very high level. The photography by Dean Cundy is sublime. I think just the western setting really helps push its visual style, where part 2 looked a bit flat in places. The ending of part 3 has left some divided. The idea of Doc Brown creating a time travelling train does seem very far fetched. There would be lots of materials unavailable to him in 1885, so it kind of contradicts earlier scenes when they were struggling to repair the DeLorean. But in the end of the day, it does wrap up the trilogy nicely. It's hard to think what else they could have done with the ending. The DeLorean was destroyed like they said they would do once they got back to 1985, and Marty had corrected the past and got back to the correct timeline. If you are a fan of the series, then you already know Part 3 is very entertaining. But if you haven't seen it in a long time and felt it was lacking, then I hope I've encouraged you to see it again.